STEM science project involving the role of cell planing densities and their cell-cell cluster interaction patterns on the viability and attachment of human keratinocyte low-passage cell lines. To summarize this in, in layman's terms, I took human keratinocyte skin cells, threw them in laboratory, and, and experimented on various principles to see how I could maximize their growth in the period of time that I was working with them. So some background on my project. In order for cells to grow and thrive in lab conditions, the cells must be able to grow, multiply, and attach to the cell culture flasks. The cell culture flasks that I used in my experiment, pictured in the top left-hand corner, are a small flask in various sizes where the cells that you are using for your project are able to attach and grow in this laboratory. The cell viability, or the ability of the cells to actually grow and thrive, is dependent on the plating density of the cells, which is the number of cells per square centimeter in your cell culture flasks, the proper amount of growth medium, which is supplemented with agents that allow the cells to grow, maintaining the proper pH level, which is necessary for adequate oxygen and carbon dioxide for the cells, and of course, the temperature of the cells, which is 37 degrees Celsius in an incubator. The cells that I used in my experiment are human keratinocytes. Human keratinocytes are found in the epidermis and they compose approximately 95% of it. Here you see I have these cells pictured, and all of these purple cells you see here are human keratinocytes in the epidermis, and some are found into the dermis. These cells are arranged in many layers, and they form tight junctions with the nerves of the skin and maintain cell placement so the skin can act as a cohesive layer. Since keratinocytes are found in the stratified epithelium, they're able to metastasize and form cancers, and almost all the tumor cells that we have in our body actually originate from this skin layer and metastasize as a single cell in the bloodstream. Most of these tumor cells that actually break away from the skin don't manage to survive. The very small number do if they have the proper oxygen and supplements in the bloodstream that are able to allow these tumors to grow. And in my experiment, I want to determine how the plating densities I discussed, the number of cells per square centimeter in my culture flasks, allowed human keratinocytes to grow in the laboratory and affected the way the cells cluster, the way they attach to the cell flasks, and the vitality of the cells, or how the cells were able to live. Understanding these mechanisms behind this type of cell and its growth allowed my growth conditions to be optimized in experimentation when you're using these type of cells in a laboratory setting. And so I hypothesized that human keratinocytes plated at higher densities, meaning more cells were in these cell flasks per square centimeter, would achieve the highest cell viability and the greatest rates of cell growth because the human keratinocyte growth trends were optimized. And I thought a higher plating density would have more available cells that were able to culture and proliferate. Well, cells plated at lower densities wouldn't achieve these same results simply because there weren't enough cells to actively proliferate in these conditions. And the cell densities that I tested, two times 10 to the fourth cells per square centimeter, I thought that would have a higher consistent cell density within each colony in the highest number of viable cells, meaning cells that are able to be used for experimentation. Compared to the lower cell densities I tested, two times 10 to the three cells per square centimeter and one times 10 to the fourth cells per square centimeter. So in my experiment, I used basic cell culturing supplies, such as serological pipettes and micropipettes, which are used to extract medium and reagents for use in the cell culture flasks, a class two laminar flow hood pictured here which allows you to work with cells in a sanitary environment where no contamination can take place. Supplemented growth medium, which as I mentioned before, contains growth agents that allow the cells to have the food they need to survive. An inverted microscope for viewing the cells and counting them. And cell culture flasks, of course, which are pictured here and are used to maintain the cells. Procedure. To prepare the cells for culturing, I used this growth medium that was particular to the human keratinocytes that I was using in my experiment, and I supplemented it with this growth factor, which is crucial for their survival. I added five milliliters of this medium to each flask, and I plated the cells at an initial density of one times 10 to the fourth cells per square centimeter. Every 48 hours, I changed the medium in order to maintain the pH and oxygen levels for the cells to survive, and I changed it every 24 hours once the cells took up half the surface area in the flask until they were ready for subculturing. Subculturing and culturing, by the way, what I was doing in my initial experiment was simply taking the cells that were cryopreserved in vials that I ordered from an online science company, and I plated them by inserting them into this flask. 
Subculturing is when the cells reach a high enough confluency, meaning they've covered most of the surface area of the flask, and you were able to take the cells in one flask, take 30% of each, and divide that into three flasks. So you're able to multiply the number of cells you have to work with your, to, in your experiment to maximize the results, so you have a higher subject group to work with. And I collected information about the percentage of cells actually attached to the bottom of these flasks, the number of cell colonies that I counted in the cells, meaning cells that were attached to each other in groups, and the actual number of cells in the plating density attached by the formula, cells attached divided by the cells plated at fixed intervals over the course of 24 hours. And the data I collected ended up supporting my hypothesis. I figured out that the cells plated at the lowest density of two times 10 to the third cells per square centimeter had clusters that were mostly composed of two cells per square centimeter. To simplify this graph for you a bit more, the red, the red, green, and blue shows the densities that I use. So all of these blue bars on the graph correspond to my lowest plating density, well, my, excuse me, my highest plating density, while the others correspond to the two lower plating densities that I tested. And as you can see, the cells that are plated at two times 10 to the third cells have mostly two cells per in each cell cluster that I counted in my flask, while cells plated at higher densities of two times 10 to the fourth cells and one times, 10 to, one times 10 to the fourth cells per square centimeter, their cell clusters were composed of more cells. So in these cell clusters, I counted as many as 60 cells in each cluster, while at lower densities, I counted as little as two cells in each cluster. I also figured out that the higher the cell density, the more spread cells there were. Spread cells are when the cells are actively dividing and spreading in the cell cluster within the flask. So I, I figured out that the cell density, the higher the cell density was, the more cell clusters that were spreading that I counted compared to unspread cells found at lower plating densities. And I also took data on the attachment of these viable human keratinocytes due to the cell density itself over the course of my three trials I used in my experiment. And I found overall in my first trial, I had the highest recorded plating densities for all three cell densities that I tested, while in trials two and three, the results were lower. This could be due to a variety of experimental factors. And here I have pictures of the cells themselves that I took using an inverted microscope. So as you can see in the top left-hand corner, this is a lower magnification, and this is when I initially plated my cells. So you see they're all single cells. There's no cells that are actively dividing in colonies. This is right after five minutes after I plated the cells, so none of them are attached yet. They're still free-floating within the cell culture flask. This picture in the top right-hand corner was 24 hours after I plated my second set of cells. As you can see here, there's cell clusters that are actively dividing with two or more cells per cluster. And this is at the second highest plating density that I tested. So as you can see, there's cells that have three cells per cluster, two cells per cluster, and as many as 12 cells per cluster. And here at the bottom, this is the highest magnification of image that I took of the cells individually. So this is a single human keratinocyte cell, which is the same thing as one of those in the upper left-hand corner, just at a much higher resolution. And so I concluded that the data I collected supported my initial hypothesis. The cells that I plated at higher plating densities achieved a greater cell viability and a greater attachment rate within the culture flasks. I also concluded that the spreading nature of these cells in isolated clusters played a role in the number of viable cells, meaning if the cells clustered and had a greater number of cells in each cluster, they ended up surviving longer and having a greater viability overall than cells that were in smaller clusters with only two cells per cluster or three cells per cluster. I also figured out that cells plated at higher density had fewer numerical quantities of cells, yet had a greater number of cells in each cluster. So the cells that were at higher densities, they didn't have as many clusters themselves, but the clusters that they did have had many more cells in each of them than the cells that I plated at lower densities. And the rates of proliferation, meaning how the cells spread within the culture flasks, were the, about the same amongst all three cell densities that I tested. There are many applications in my research as well. These experimental results are useful for devising a more effective culturing protocol for any scientist that would like to work with these type of cells in laboratory conditions. 
These are also useful for developing keratinocyte burn or skin grafts more effectively. Skin grafts are a very important field in health and science research for people who have been burn victims. And this is considered the most efficient way to currently grow enough skin for burn victims. And making this protocol more efficient is very important. I also can use these experiment findings for understanding the mechanisms behind metastasis and the development of tumor cells, such as melanoma, that originate from the skin. And because I studied how cells attach and how they thrive in their early growth stages, they, the differences I observe between spread and unspread cell cultures have applications in isolating single cells in the laboratory and, and, and understanding their ability to thrive and initiate mitosis. And the isolation of these individual cell clusters ties back into potential avenues of cancer research because these cells can be used as stem cells and they can also reflect on different types of cells that can be studied using these same type of procedures, such as nerve cells, epithelial cells, or even pancreas cells. And I'm interested in doing future research on this topic as well. I could use an alternative cell type instead of human keratinocyte skin cells. I could manipulate the cell lines into many sub-passages, which means that I am taking one culture flask and using the cell populations within that flask to devise many more cell culture flasks to have a higher number of cells I'm using in my experimentation. I can use immortalized cell lines, which means manipulating their DNA <coughs> so the cells don't die, just to have a more accurate study of impacting cancer-type cells. I can utilize a longer period for experimentation to see if that impacts the growth rate of these cells. And I can also study another characteristic that influences the cell vitality in, in vivo, not just the plating densities, but factors such as the temperature or the pH level. And I can also determine the roles of a cell contact meaning the way the cells communicate with each other via the junctional protein plaque of globin, which is something that I've been actively researching at my school recently. Thank you. Do the judges have any questions? <laughs> That's a lot, I know. No, no, it's just it was detailed and beautiful. Thank you. How, how old are you? I'm 15. You're 15 years old. How did you come across this subject? How did you decide this it's is what you It's kind of an interesting understand? course that I came to this particular subject because I've always been fascinated by science in general. And within my 4-H club, we've done a variety of unrelated but still topics that are within the STEM field, such as engineering and robotics and electricity. But I've always been interested in the biological aspects of science that you may not be able to study directly in the 4-H club that have a lot of similar applications in the STEM field. Mm -hmm. And so I've always competed in science fairs at my school and at the state level. And so in my biology class in eighth grade, we were learning about a lot of the ways these cells divide and how the cell lives and the mitosis cycle. And I was really interested in that. And this past year when I was talking to some of the faculty at my school that are involved in the science fair research, one of them suggested that I talk to a professor at the Scripps Institute, and upon doing further research and looking at published science articles on the website Pulse One, which is where I got a lot of this information from, that really helped me choose a topic that was parallel with what the research needs, like what you need to do to further research in this particular field and what my interests are. Do you plan to continue to pursue this? I definitely do, yeah. As I mentioned before, um, I'm taking one aspect of this project because this project, even though it seems very sophisticated, is a general project in this field. So I'm isolating one particular protein that is found in these cells called placoglobin, and I am genetically manipulating it to see how that influences the ways the cells are able to survive in cancer cells in particular. Mm -hmm. So are you going to go beyond cell with the actual DNA? I am, yes. Yeah. So I'm going like one step further. With I'm using the same cell type, but this is particularly valuable in cancers that are very complex, such as melanoma, and often interact with other cell types and have a high metastasis rate. Because if you have a cancer such as melanoma, it doesn't. It's not so much the skin cells themselves that are dangerous. It's the fact that it has such a high rate of metastasis and it spreads all over the body. And that's what I'm interested in pursuing to see if I can bring that rate down and make the cancer more survivable. So. 15 years old, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs>